Hello and welcome to Crash Course. I'm Hungry, and today we're going to be talking about something that many of you either have nightmares about learning, or something you've never even learned at all. Math. Mathematics is a very broad subject, so instead of boring you with a list of proofs and theorems, we're just going to bore you with the creation of those proofs and theorems. And although you may think that mathematics is only something you learn to graduate, without mathematics, our lives would be similar to the nomadic societies that had to work less, had no class divisions, and had no obesity. It would be a nightmare. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about math. No, not that math. Yes, that math. Our journey begins thousands of years ago when number systems first began to emerge in various civilizations around the globe. Different regions had different systems. These primitive systems gradually emerged into counting methods with base systems, including base 10, 12, 16, and 60, which later will become the basis for our current time measurements and the degree system. Around 600 BC, the abacus was independently invented in Greece, Rome, Egypt, India, and China. These were primitive calculators which are still in use today. Also independently invented was the number pi, that famous number that we all try to memorize as kids. That was only me? You sure? Well, I didn't think I had a life back then. Oh, oh, oh! Yes, me from the past? Did you really draw a 192-sided polygon in your living room in order to approximate pi? Oh, me from the past. Sometimes I wonder how I'm related to you at all. And no, that was so Chongzhi in the 400s. We're on pi later. From 500 BC to approximately 500 CE, the Mediterranean basin became a center of scientific advancements in everything from mathematics to astronomy to philosophy. Pythagoras, one of the earliest Greek mathematicians, did not actually come up with the famous theorem named after him. In fact, there is substantial evidence that the Babylonians knew of the formula, and the Egyptians definitely did. It was used for measuring how much land you owned, which was in turn used to force you to pay taxes. As the saying goes, there are only two certainties in life, modification and taxes. Pythagoras did create the religion of Pythagoreanism, where followers worship numbers as gods. They turned out an amazing number of theorems. Pythagoras was also the first to experiment with the link between math and music, and the scent system we use to measure pitch is the same one he used. Pythagoras had a dark side, though. He considered irrational numbers imperfect and prosecuted Hippasus, with some credit with discovering square root of 2. The ultimate downfall of the Pythagoreans came when they got into politics, the same as every other politician ever. A few years later in Syracuse, Archimedes was one of the leading scholars of his time. He is best known for his contributions to physics, but he also made advances in mathematics way ahead of his time. He applied the method of exhaustion, a primitive form of calculus, to many problems concerning areas and curves. Oh, it's time for the letter. <laughs> yes, I did just break that so much here. An open letter to Archimedes. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, look, a mirror. Dang, I look good today. An open letter to Archimedes. Dear Archimedes, where would we be without you? You invented the adjustable catapult, the planetarium, differential gears, the Archimedes screw, basically everything. You even used mirrors and sunlight to burn enemy ships, which probably could conquer any army ever. Unless you're, wait for it, the Mongols. Overall, Archimedes, you're the epitome of what every mathematician wants to be. Awesome. Best wishes, I'm still hungry. Too bad Archimedes was killed by a Roman soldier during the Roman invasion of Syracuse. That would suck doing your math homework and having a Roman soldier march in and stab you. Living around the same time was Euclid, often considered the father of geometry. This title gives Euclid too much credit, but it does show how influential he was. Euclid's magnum opus was his Elements, a series of textbooks that became the foundation for conic sections, spherical geometry, number theory, and even geometry. Many modern textbooks are still based on this work. During the Dark Ages, when people were more concerned with farming lettuce than with the beauty of the universe, development of all sorts in Europe stagnated, and most advances occurred in India and the Muslim world, where we will go next. In India, the concept of negative numbers was emerging. Negative numbers were useful in dealing with debt, and is now why we have debtors prisons. Around the same time, the concept of zero also emerged in Egypt and India independently, again for accounting purposes. On the other hand, Muslim scholars made their own advances. Al-Khwarizmi wrote the first treatise on algebra, the bane of all middle schoolers today. 
and is their occupation as traders, Muslims help spread concepts across Eurasia, popularizing Indian concepts such as the decimal systems. Moving along in history, we arrive at the Scientific Revolution. The Scientific Revolution saw the birth of numerous influential mathematicians, Galileo, Fibonacci, Napier, Descartes, and Fermat, to name a few. Many of these mathematicians, such as Fibonacci, Pascal, and Fermat, translated Muslim works in addition to writing their own books. Fibonacci's Libra Abaci related mathematics and money, and together with Pascal, set the stage for probability theory. It is worth noting that the Fibonacci series was one of those things Fibonacci merely translated. Fermat, who lived after Fibonacci, is infamous for not writing proofs in margins. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. Many people doubt this claim because when Andrew Wiles proved it 358 years later, his proof was over 100 pages long. If you look at the advances in, in, math in mathematics around this time, most were in Italy, the birthplace of the Renaissance. This was obviously a direct result of the exchange of ideas that came with the flourishing of trade. Elsewhere in Europe, René Descartes, a philosopher and a mathematician, was chronically sick and mostly lay in bed and stared at the ceiling. He bridged geometry, the study of shapes and figures, with algebra, the study of equations and numbers, with a system of analytical geometry, in turn based on the Cartesian plane. Eponymous with its creator, the Cartesian plane allowed geometric figures to be translated into simple algebraic expressions. Jean Napier discovered logarithms. We're out of time, but I haven't talked about the Bernoullis yet! Okay... With the convergence of algebra and geometry, we can finally begin to talk about what you've all been waiting for, calculus. Newton and Leibniz both independently published similar ideas on calculus at the same time. But Newton completely bashed Leibniz, calling him a plagiarizer and ruining Leibniz's career. The originality of Leibniz's work is the limit as x approaches zero from the negative side of 1 over x. Nowadays, most people do think Newton came up with calculus a few years earlier. Calculus enabled Newton to do some really cool things with physics. It was arguably the first time anyone had ever summarized the laws of nature into simple equations. Let's go to the thought bubble. In the early 1700s, a mathematician named Leonhard Euler came on the scene. The most prolific mathematician in history, Euler made major advancements in geometry, trigonometry, algebra, calculus, number theory, astronomy, and physics. His most important work involved infinite series and complex numbers, such as the square root of negative one. He wrote so much, in fact, that there is a famous quote. Objects in mathematics are named after the first person to discover them after Euler did. Finally, we start getting into the modern age of math which coalesced into one of the most complicated pieces of machinery ever to cost $99 on Craigslist, the computer. This is where you see more things like this, or this, or this. The word for computer was actually coined in 1613 by an English writer named Richard Braithwaite. Is that how you pronounce it, Dad? Yeah? Oh, okay. Who wrote... I have read the truest computer of times, and the best arithmetician that ever breathed, and he reduceth thy days into a short number. Computer, in this case, referred to someone who did math, and maintained this definition up until the mid-20th century when the computer itself was invented. Thanks, Thought Bubble. This brings us to the father of modern computer science, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Really, not him? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure everything ever invented was by him. No? Alan Turing? Fine. I guess I can talk about him for a few minutes. In 1936, Turing was the first to conceptualize the algorithm and computing with his Turing machine, which used different colored tapes to represent ones and zeros, or as you all know, binary. Turing himself called it the A machine, or automatic machine, but was later turned into the Turing machine after Big Brother accidentally said Turing machine in the newspaper and ordered the A machine to be renamed. Nevertheless, Turing's revolutionary model laid the groundwork for what was to be the first ever electronic digital computer, the ABC, or Atanasoff Barry computer, because you know how crazy John Atanasoff was for the Jackson 5. ABC was not programmable, however, all it could do was solve linear equations, and by the way, next time you complain about the bulkiness of your graphing calculator, um, think of the much less effective ABC. Now that we've bored you with a brief overview of how mathematics gradually developed into the complex subject that we know of today, you're probably wondering, why should I care? 
Knowledge of algebra allows us to think more critically, and without it, we would be less able to analyze and solve problems we encounter. Advances by Euclid and Descartes in geometry paved the way for the construction of larger and more intricate architecture, and also granted us a greater understanding of phenomena in the universe, from astronomy to optics. Lastly, the formulation of calculus allows us to observe how objects in motion behave. So next time you complain about having to do your math homework, be glad that only takes an hour and not your entire lifetime. Thanks for watching. I won't see you next week. Crash Course is brought to you by Crash Course is produced and directed by myself, Ian and Josh. Our script supervisors are Ian, Josh, and myself. The show is written by Josh, myself, and Ian. Our graphics team consists of myself and Ian, and we're interned by nobody.